I'm just like, mm, sugar slide, please. <laughs> ah, yes, thank you. Oh, do we have to? Ooh, I should have brought my glasses too. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cheers, cheers. Well, to uh, yeah, looking forward to a nice conversation. Did you two know each other already? I also met Chengdu as well doing a residency here. Yes, uh, so residencies unite. I was based in the Philippines. Uh, I only moved here three years ago, so I'm originally from the Philippines. Um, oh my gosh. There's no broadcast of this, right? Or there is? Mm. Oh dear. Say a few words before the presentation. Okay. Okay, I think we can begin. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Sophia, Pilar, Yinyin, and Thomas, who is not here for the invitation. And um, welcome to the last panel of the day, right? Yes, okay. So I'm just going to read everybody's uh, biographies. And just so you know, the format for today's panel is uh, Cengiz and Sophie will start with presentations on their practice, brief presentations, then we'll enter a discussion. And when we have nothing to say, um, we will ask Yarun over there to launch a trigger slide. So the speakers have been asked to prepare some slides to trigger conversation. So yeah, that's what's going to happen. So I'll read the biographies. Um, Sophie Douala is, based, is a Berlin-based, France-raised, and Cameroon-born art director and visual artist specialized in storytelling and creative campaigns. Cengiz Menguch is a Rotterdam-based graphic designer and visual artist whose current practice moves between commissioned design work, self-initiated research projects, cultural programming, and making flyers for shisha lounges. <laughs> My name is Clara Balaguer. Uh, I'm originally from the Philippines. I moved to Rotterdam three and a half years ago. I often describe myself as a cultural worker and gray literature circulator who builds and publishes curriculums at Bach, Basis for Aktuelle Kunst, Willem de Koning Academy in the Social Practices Department, Pietzwart Institute at Experimental Publishing, and Sandberg Institute at the Dirty Art Department. Um, so, yeah, who wants to, you want to do paper, rock, scissors to see who goes first? <laughs> I don't know which one uh, of the is presentations ready. is ready. Ah, that's me. Okay. <laughs> Ladies um, first. <laughs> my name is Cengiz Menguic. I'm a graphic designer and visual artist based in Rotterdam. Uh, my slideshow contains some work of the past years. Uh, I consider my practice really as a mix of different things that moves between doing commissions for art and cultural institutions, as well as having multiple side jobs, doing commercial work, uh, working on projects with friends, organizing events, and doing self-initiated research projects. Um, at this moment, I'm trying to focus on making new work based on my ongoing research into design and advertising practices in Turkish-Dutch communities and the different migrant design cultures that are hosted in the streets of Rotterdam as well as other European cities, trying to understand how design is constructed and how cultural and diasporic identity and heritage is expressed in these kind of everyday spaces. Um, this interest started while I was studying graphic design in Arnhem and at the same time was working at the dinner kebab shop of my dad <coughs> and like helping him out um, like making his logo uh, signage and menu, um, menu cards and so on. And after my studies, I ended up working in a local advertising studio and sign maker uh, in Rotterdam West, doing advertising and making signages for local small businesses, mostly migrant owned, like street bakeries, uh, barber shops, car repair shops, 
uh, shisha lounges and so on, as you also see in the, some work in the slideshow. Uh, and this was like a really low-key, uh, street-level, uh, small, open studio where people would just walk in and you would m often make things on the spot. And after graduating from an art school and being trained as an autonomous graphic designer, uh, here I really had to unlearn a lot of things and translate my practice uh, to adopt a different way of working that was more hands-on and uh, pragmatic, working under different circumstances in which uh, design was being produced. And still my practice really moves between these uh, different worlds uh, and I try to incorporate these different languages and approaches to design from uh, these different worlds through which I move, uh, exploring and adopting different ways of working together, uh, unlearning, collaborating, doing my own research, uh, working uh, both for and with art institutions, but as well uh, working and conducting uh, research on the streets, with I, which I uh, all consider like a really open and ongoing process. Um, yeah, that was my presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, I would love to say a few words before we start uh, the video. Uh, so my name is Sophie Douala, um, and uh, first of all, I'm super happy to be here. So thank you for the invitation because it's the first time that I get invited uh, to a panel to talk and to tell my voice. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I had a few things that I wanted to tell in regards to this panel and uh, for you to understand my work. So I've, um, and I was, <laughs> I, I was a bit afraid to be nervous. <laughs> so I just prepared a video, uh, it's three minutes. And uh, yeah, and then I'm happy to take on questions about it. Hi, my name is Sophie Douala. I'm a visual artist and graphic designer based in Berlin. I was born in Cameroon and grew up in France. My work is an ongoing exploration of sensations, feelings and concepts. But also when working with clients, I try to reflect on their intentions and messages and translate that with a graphic language. Observe, state, state, question, the essence, the essence interpret, intention, intention, represent, perception. perception. your approach to design? <laughs> my journey is part of my personal identity. And as such, my work is a mediator of that same identity. The way I approach design is to question. Through this curiosity and openness, I find progress. has taught me that collaborating on branding is not only a series of negotiations, but also an exchange of shared values and identities. Is my work ethic a magnifying glass of my own quest of identity? Is it a way to claim my space? To fight against the lack of representation I have suffered from? Within my work, 
I found a craving for building communities, challenging the status quo, and pushing boundaries. I guess, uh, yeah, because your presentation was the most recent. I was listening, I wasn't texting people, I was <laughs> writing down. Um, but yeah, you, you mentioned that your approach to design is to be a mediator of identity. Um, it's very intimate to mediate somebody's identity, or, or even if that somebody is a corporate entity. Uh, how do you build trust in order to be allowed to do that? So maybe the first clarification is that um, I guess I meant that um, it was a mediator of my own identity. So um, whenever, um, I guess like I'm, what I try to say is that I, I am my work basically. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Because you also work with, uh, Cengiz works with like a let's say, a, a set of clients that perhaps a modernist, educated graphic designer from a fancy school would not generally work with. So yeah, how do you uh, build trust with your clients in order to mediate their identity? Um, so yeah, I think this, um, this sense of trust is, uh, is mostly already there because uh, you were referencing to the, to, like, to the advertising studio, um, which is, um, run by um, a, a Turkish guy, uh, Mesut, shout out to him. Yes. Um, so there, uh, I, I, uh, I noticed while working there, there's already this, uh, this understanding and this, uh, this trust as both uh, like the clients and both the, the owner of the advertising studio were like um, have a migrant background or <clears throat> are pe people of color that are, uh, I don't know that that uh, in a way already understand each other and trust each other and also prefer to do business with each other, uh, in my uh, experience at least. Um, and also me being um, um, like having Turkish Dutch uh, background, uh, I feel um, I can quite easily, um, yeah, like understand and uh, adapt to the this like. Uh, um, social situation that's mm. that's happening and uh uh also yeah w i don't know with my own uh background and um also in the design work that i have done uh i think uh quite uh soon can establish this uh like mutual understanding of uh of what um uh, yeah what the client wants and uh, uh and build this certain uh, trust yeah mm. And um, what clients do you usually work with? Um, like, what's the gamut? Mm. So um, <coughs> I worked um, a lot with uh, musicians. Um, I did a lot of brand identity for music labels and for um, yeah um, musicians. But uh, lately, I've taken much more commissions with. Um, collectives or uh, organizations uh, that uh, us that uh, have um, a certain message. Um, and I think it has, um, of course, affected uh, the process of uh, working, um, kind of also related to your question about trust. Um, also, in my approach i believe that i work um a lot with my community so um okay i have also international clients but i try to work within um, my connections and to also help uh, people that uh, i know uh, who has uh, who have um, project i try to also help them develop this um, I don't know if I should say some examples of that. Or is this Do you have any examples? Or um, in the presentation, I don't have example, but I have an example in my mind that's something that would fit. Uh, Could you describe it? Yeah, of course, because I think like um, what is 
also interesting is uh, the process of that collaboration. So even less than the uh, final um, uh, creation. Um, so one project that I wanted to talk about today, for instance, is um, the Open Music Lab. They are a music school um, in Berlin and they are offering uh, free music workshops to uh, minorities. In, uh, in priority. And um, my friend has uh, launched that project and I really wanted to find a way to support their project. So uh, I decided to create a t-shirt that uh, we would sell. And uh, I proposed her the project and I said maybe we could share uh, you know, that we could help each other to um, promote the design and, this, um, and then share the profit of it. So it was, in a way, like maybe not the usual client to come to you with a proposition, but uh, me as a designer coming to someone that I trust <laughs> mm. to uh, <coughs> then propose a project that would benefit both of us. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing when working with like in, in affective circles with friends, with family and yeah, also Masood's clients because yeah, I've met Masood and he's amazing. Uh, we've visited a couple of times. Um, but uh, yeah, there is a certain or there are different financial rules, mm. I think, uh, when working in affective circles. So yeah, maybe, uh, maybe Cengiz, it would be interesting if you could yeah describe or, or have you, what are the different financial structures that you have encountered when working in close affective circles mm -hmm. as a designer mm -hmm. um, without revealing too much yeah, about yeah, uh, yeah. gray <laughs> financial <laughs> practices yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I, I guess it has also to do with the issue of trust um, um, yeah first of all I think so I, I work like uh, as I said in the in the introduction as well like uh, both in like uh, art uh, and cultural world uh, and as well in this um, yeah advertising world I've worked for a bit and I think the um, the main difference is uh, like design is produced under such different circumstances with different uh, time frames. Uh, and the different financial uh, like like budgets, um, so it's it's really um, like it's really uh, like um, technical, let's say. So if you want a, a, a light box or some uh, LED uh, adver LED uh, light advertising, it's just uh, very uh, um, practical. That's that has a certain price to it. You know hmm. the 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 material uh, costs and then uh, like a little uh, is added for the design of it. Uh, and um, yeah, as uh, far as I can tell from my experience, a lot is also, um, you know, it's um, uh, like gentlemen's uh, agreement. Hmm. So just uh, by word, how do you Word, like word of mouth. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, just a, a basic understanding and trust of we're going to work together. Mm. This is what we agreed on that day. You said this mm. simple. That's true. Mm. And, uh, yeah, of, yeah, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I don't know. No, I'm not gonna okay. too much detail. All right. All right. <laughs> we, we won't reveal any like underground financial practices. Um, but, um, I had maybe a more general question in terms of like, um, yeah, you're both um, uh, multicultural, uh, diasporic designers working in different, many different contexts. And yeah, you in, I can't help but think about the design canons that we have been fed through our education, through mm. mass media, and how those um, interfere or contradict with um, our own experience of being excluded from those canons. So my general question to the both of you, mm. I wish we had a buzzer so that you could, <laughs> you know, buzz in first. But yeah, do you want to be let into the canon or would you rather mm. they do away with the canon altogether? One, two, three, go. 
Okay, we'll repeat. I didn't understand the order. Do, get the last do you part. Want, do you want to be let into the canon? So do you want this like different experience or different form of representing your identity through design? Uh, do you want that to be um, considered as part of the canon or would you rather we throw away the canon altogether and start from scratch? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I would say that um, I think uh, we can't, or we should not erase anything that uh, has happened. Um, it's uh, more of a continuity. Um, I think uh, we, as uh, collaborative workers, are working towards um, changing something. Um, rather, and so basically what I'm trying to say is that we are um, just, uh, oh, sorry, I got lost. That's all right. We can take a breath. Uh, Changes, would you like to jump in? <laughs> it was, wait, well, maybe, okay, you were talking about collaboration. Yeah, no, can you just say one more time the question, okay. please? <laughs> do you want to be let into the canon, into the design canon, or do you want us to throw away the canon and yeah. start from scratch? So I guess what I try to say is that we are getting in the canon by ourselves. It's not someone who's letting us in. It's like we are doing the work uh, of like uh, creating some changes, creating maybe more awareness. Uh, so I, I wouldn't even say that it's about getting in or getting out. It's just like kind of multiple uh, groups that are, you know, um, um, playing a role, a different role. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Mm. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I also agree with that. Uh, I think the, um, I mean, I think it's uh, time for the canon to also, um, yeah, to, to definitely also uh, incorporate like these uh, different voices in design and uh, um, not only like, uh, yeah, I don't know, like getting, um, getting stuck in like one kind of uh, conversation, but I also feel at the same time, um, yeah, these different like worlds of design and different discourses that are going on um they can um they can just be and they can here and there overlap mm. and uh as i said i um uh, i quite like to be um flexible to just move between like different uh different worlds and different discourses mm -hmm. um but yeah I, I guess for future generations or like in uh, just uh at least from the, the design like education where I come from uh, it's definitely good to have more more voices more uh, approaches more methods mm. than just of the one that it often is mm -hmm. yes speaking of more voices does anybody have any questions uh, for the panelists um, Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's, um, uh, it's a question to uh, Cengiz. It's, um, it's, very, it's a funny question. Um, <laughs> maybe it's not funny. Um, we'll be the judge <laughs> of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have uh, visited Istanbul and also seen um, shisha or um, uh, durum shops everywhere. And I have this uh, sensation that the, the identity is really um, seen by its capital letters, or the use of capital mm -hmm. letters. And it's weird because, for example, for me, in chatting, when you start writing in capital letters, it's like you're screaming. <laughs> it's like you're rah. Mm -hmm. How is it perceived capital letters in the Turkish uh, <laughs> identity? <laughs> Do you mm -hmm. scream while you use these capital letters or? Very often. <laughs> 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 no, I, uh, I don't know. It's. Uh, I am also, I, I uh, definitely share the same uh, observations and I, uh, 
I really think it also fits with a, um, a kind of maximalist uh, approach to design. Uh, uh, <coughs> like, and from like European perspective, I can definitely um, understand how like uh, how this is like really bold or shouting even. Um, but I don't know actually if it's <laughs> like. Uh, a I can, I, yeah, do you I can add, I mean, from the Philippines, yeah. which is, I mean, all caps script yeah. uh, was actually uh, with, um, I also have a publishing house and whatever, design, whatever, it's called hardworking, good looking, and I worked a lot with a couple of Filipino-American graphic designers, and also doing a lot of street research, so trying to, instead of looking towards the West for inspiration, kind of taking the streets, what was around us, as the first point of departure for a design brief, essentially. And so what that entailed was basically trying to identify a new taxonomy uh, of moves, basically, and try to understand why these moves were there. So all cap script uh, is, uh, I think, yeah, maybe post-colonially, or yeah, it's a, yeah, I don't know, post-colonial, but yeah, it's, it's a common thing. Um, my amateur, um, maybe not, yeah, my, my amateur kind of interpretation is the fact that um, uh, sometimes they're using uh, all caps. It's like also the uh, quotation marks. So those are just ways to um, make something stand out a bit more. So like it's funny when yeah when you see quotation marks being used in a sign, it looks like people are being ironic, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but they're actually not. They're just saying look at me. Mm -hmm. So all caps is basically look at me, mm -hmm. and then combined with the script typeface, which is like ooh fancy curvy, I like mm -hmm. it. So not sans serif, something that. Uh, expresses identity actually or fluidity or, or maybe penmanship so something that expresses something human and we yeah, are with designers who don't know that that's wrong mm. um, and then that turns into kind of like a, yeah an error plus a practical function uh, turns into a new language mm -hmm. hmm. so that's my yeah nods I think yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, anybody else have any questions Uh, it's a question for Ceng Cengiz. Um, uh, maybe you are familiar with this, but um, um, I mean, there are there have been like a few studios, um, I think also here in the Netherlands, that have b taken like the, let's say, the, the general kebab shop uh, logo and make T-shirts out of it. Mm. What do you think? Uh, are you following this? Do you think it's like a scene? that is trying to recuperate this language and making it hip? Or like, how do you see this phenomenon? Thank you. Oh, interesting question. Mm -hmm. I definitely seen it. And it's also not the first time. I, you know, I mean, it, I think it's from uh, all time. It's things uh, I think are always there. Um, but I always try to, for myself, look who's behind it and what is the intentions of it. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, uh, a lot of I mean, it's not uh, of, of obviously like this, um, and not only this. Like a lot of aesthetics are of like appropriated and taken, uh, and uh, yeah, I, 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 it's really who's behind it and what's the the purpose of it. You know, uh, I think um, for a lot of. Um, people or even institutions or brands, it's very easy to like take uh, take some um, aspect of um, a visual culture to, I don't know, uh, to do their thing with it. Uh, I think it's, um, yeah, important to also consider or understand the, the, the culture behind it and, um, um, well, yeah, uh, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this segues a bit into one of my other questions, which uh, maybe is, uh, yeah, I mean, first it would be nice to hear from the panelists, but if anybody else from the audience actually has mm. um, an answer to this question, it would be, ooh. Uh, <laughs> okay, you had a, um, well, I started already, so. Um, Hold that thought, maybe, and then we can, yeah, because now, okay, anyway. <laughs> we'll come to you. I see you. Um, but yeah, my question, I, I think to the world at large, is what nuance can we add 
to the politically familiar views as opposed to correct, politically correct, because it's unlikely that humans will agree on, on what is correct. Mm. So what nuance can be added to the politically familiar views around the issue of cultural appropriation? Let it sink in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go what? ahead. I mean, um, I've been thinking about this uh, question of cultural appropriation a lot. <laughs> and uh, personally, I, I see already inside me kind of a uh, two way of thinking. So um, I see um, when I think with my heart, uh, my heart has been offended, my heart has been, uh, you know, uh, suffered from, uh, from things and I, my response is very emotional towards it. So, um, but when I start thinking um, with my head, <laughs> then my head um, is uh, much more about uh, bringing more awareness and uh, also um, I think it's also kind of weird to forbid something. I don't know, like this idea of forbidding something. Um, I think it's uh, my head doesn't really quite understand that. So, um, I, I was thinking that um, maybe uh, if uh, actually there would be more diversity, <laughs> I, I wonder if the question of cultural appropriation would even e exist. Yeah, so that was... Uh, <laughs> For purposes of the recording, she said, I think it's never said, <laughs> and I think that's good, and there was an applause. <laughs> um, yeah, I like that you mentioned thinking with your heart. Like, I think, yeah, the, the heart is connected. Uh, or the to memories, <laughs> yeah. to so many things, you know, but, um, yeah, I, 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 was, um, I was really reflecting on this, and I, I think, like, if we manage to, you know, bring more diversity within everything basically so that means uh, more communication more uh, different backgrounds more different cultures coming together um, then there will be more understanding so um, I think the understanding and the respect the respect is um, is really something that would uh, fa facilitate uh, this do you have any nuance to add Cengiz uh, I think one thing that is overlooked often is also the issue of class, uh, mm -hmm. because like what's um, well at least like my little corner, it's um, yeah, it is a working class migrant uh, like visual culture that uh, that, that I'm uh, working with at least, and uh, also uh, in regard to your question earlier. Uh, this also has to be taken in account. Like there's mul like there's mm. so many layers to it. You know, it's like culture, uh, but definitely also not forget uh, class. Mm -hmm. mm. Anybody have? We are not the harbingers of all wisdom. <laughs> so if no, anybody has any nuance to add. I mean, I guess like, yeah, w w when I think about cultural appropriation um, and the sort of strict lines that are enforced, uh, yeah, the first thing I think of is we do talk a lot about intercultural appropriation, but for me there is such a thing as intracultural appropriation. Like, for example, again, always speaking from my personal experience coming from the Philippines where yeah, post-colonial country whose identity has been kind of decimated by 300 years of colonization by four different colonizers. Uh, so uh, the issue of class, so for example, a lot of people talk about decolonizing as a return to the indigenous. In the Philippines, we have indigenous alphabets that were killed by colonization. They're called Alibata. Mm -hmm. And people are trying to sort of bring in Alibata as kind of the, 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 the standard or like a, a flag for decolonizing design aesthetic, um, but these are indigenous 
um, farms and there, most of the Philippine population is not indigenous. Uh, so we do have to be careful. It's not just because we're Filipino, we have access and recourse to certain indigenous knowledges. Um, we have to be careful also with the issue of class and, and it, it's, it's a moving scale of privilege, uh, mm. I think. And here in the West, people of color may feel that they're disprivileged, but then measuring uh, with yeah the homeland or the home country or the if there even is an, a, a home country like yeah to consider these moving scales of class mm. and also I guess as a final point to my soapbox I would say yeah cultural appropriation discourse coming from the West um, is sometimes to me feeling like a discourse around cultural purity which is yeah perhaps even more dangerous. Mm. So that's the bomb that I have just dropped in the room. <laughs> um, does this, yeah, how, how does this feel to the two of you? Wanna go first? Yeah. Uh, no, that, yeah, definitely. I, um, I, when you said uh, like it feels like a, um, a moving scale, I definitely, I also recognize it and, uh, um, it also, like at least for me, it's um, it's really um, something I should uh, like um, st really stay in touch with. O also, like the like just feeling, you know, just how you feel about certain uh, things and connections, and uh, like staying true to that. Uh, yeah, to yourself basically, and uh, this is very. This can very. This this is. Uh, this this changes a, uh, a lot basically like in in different situations and in different also as you I don't know like as you grow um, grow older or I don't know like certain situations change in your life because we also uh, should definitely keep in check with our own uh, privileges mm. and uh, these things can also change mm. like uh, and that's yeah yeah, I, I can really relate to um, stay true to yourself. <laughs> I think this is uh, something that is um, quite important, but also requires a lot of uh, energy somehow. Mm. Um, I um, like uh, some two years ago or so, I, I had to say no to a project um, that. Um, like it's a company that's been very recently called out. Uh, they had been called out for uh, abusing some of their POC uh, workers, and um, and they reached out to me to to do an illustration for one of their products. Uh, and I was uh, at this moment I was really trying to understand first of all like what. <laughs> what they were trying to do at this particular time uh, of being called out and then reaching out to me. But I was still uh, open for dialogue. Um, I was still open for dialogue. I didn't want to reject it uh, straight away. And um, we had a few email exchanges. And actually, I wrote a, a reply with very specific question. And um, I wanted to know a little bit more of how they were handling the situation, and I wanted to know more about um, uh, who was uh, still part uh, of the company, who was in charge, who had the power, um, and I was really hoping for them to, you know, open up in a, like, <laughs> uh, just uh, open up, basically, but uh, their reply was so mechanical. It mm. was, uh, for me, it was a copy and paste of uh, anything you can find on, yeah. <laughs> on any website online. <laughs> and, um, and I felt super hurt about it. I was super pissed, you know, because um, I was like, yeah, you, you still, I mean, I, what, what, what is the point of uh, just uh, saying uh, very generic things while I'm as actually asking you for some something a bit more in, in depth? And uh, this is the first time that I, I had to reject this, pro yeah, that I rejected a project because I felt like I would not be 
true to myself because I felt like uh, I, I didn't trust them basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it creates like this culture of fear. I'm thinking of like once when we worked with some students on a project dealing with um, some uh, articles from an archive in the Philippines. So this archive in the Philippines gave us 250 publications for students here uh, to build into, uh, so for the students to build a, a framework for an archive. And I mean, that's the contradiction of like, yeah, people say, oh yeah, let's decolonize the curriculum, mm -hmm. whatever, and then you bring decolonial deco deco or, or extra-colonial or non-canonical uh, material to the classroom. And what's shocking sometimes, or not shocking, but like painful, is that from the students who you think would be your allies, brilliant students, informed students, very, very like mm -hmm. awake, um, some of them were saying, well, I don't want to engage with this material because of cultural appropriation. Mm. And it's like, well, this is, you know, you're being given permission from an archive to mm. use these documents. Mm, mm. Um, so, yeah, there's this fear that, I mm. mean, it's good to instill the fear of God mm. in certain people, but <laughs> uh, sometimes I think it's, yeah, mm. it, it, yeah, it creates this impossibility mm. to speak people to people and mm. we lose the, the lens of intention mm -hmm. often. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah, it's like also what can you add, you know, and not uh, mm, just mm -hmm. exactly. what can you take, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. And I feel like, I mean, yeah, in, in this panel, which is, I think, to me, quite diverse, like mm. it's nice to be able to talk about these things without yeah. having to be like disclaimer, <laughs> like yeah. cis male white person on the panel, <laughs> this is not for you. So it's, yeah, nice to be able to mm -hmm. speak about this. Well, yeah, hi, everybody, you're also here, <laughs> but. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, I think this is very different from um, kind of panels I've been in in other symposiums. Um, mm. Yinyin, you had a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was the <laughs> 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 On the spot. Uh, I, I was just uh, I was just curious about uh, your work, actually. So uh, I'm I'm t maybe taking it a bit out from uh, the uh, the cultural appropriation topic. I, I know Jengis's work m a, a little bit from also from being in Rotterdam and also having worked together for Miss yes. uh, the r uh, legend of Rotterdam West. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was very intrigued uh, by the short presentation and the work you showed, also the way you showed it. I'm, uh, I thought that was uh, very refreshing, you know, after a day of conferences, it was nice that you made this uh, uh, this edit. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, your work, uh, which I, I hope to see more from later when I do a little, when I, uh, when I look online, look mm -hmm. up a little bit more. I was just wondering actually um, w where your inspiration comes from. It's mm -hmm. very eclectic, it's very colorful, very refreshing. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, where do you take inspiration from? Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, my inspiration comes a lot from the things that I will uh, that I experience, um, the people that I meet, the conversation I have, the place I go to, <laughs> um, and um, there is there is this thing as well where um, yeah I'm I'm quite of a thinker so I reflect a lot uh, on a lot of things and. Um, I mean, I didn't talk so much in depth about my work, but it's actually quite conceptual um, in that sense that, um, yeah, there is, um, uh, there, is oh, there is a concept behind uh, the choice of colors, the choice of patterns, um, the choice of uh, layout. Um, so, it also comes uh, to the moment when I talk with my client and um, I'm trying to understand, um, yeah, what is their message and what do they want to, uh, to show. And um, it's kind of an interpretation, a visual interpretation of this. Um, and there is also something that I've always tried uh, to to convey somehow it's true it's uh, some sort of uh, a good energy I think I'm someone um, who um, is very communicative when I it's when I'm not nervous <laughs> 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 um, and so um, 
I have, um, yeah, I'm trying to share some of uh, that energy also through my work um, and to, to reflect that. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the... Hi, thank you so much that this panel has totally made my day. Um, I, uh, I have so many questions. Wow. Um, <laughs> many of them are also about Durner. I will say, Genghis, um, I've always wanted to start a publication called Durner Blatt that would like review Durners. And so this is the first time that I've seen graphic design and Durner come together in such a beautiful <laughs> way. But I just want to ask, Really? Mm. That's, no, that's great. That's great. I never got to it. There were too many other projects. But um, I, rather, uh, I, I do want, I want to ask, maybe I'll ask Sophie a, a very, just a follow-up question, and then also Jenga's a question. Um, Sophie, I was just curious. Um, I'm also so intrigued by your work and very excited that you're in Berlin, because that's where I am, and hopefully I can follow up with more. But I'm curious yeah. to hear more about your own um, artistic or creative training and mm. you know how that influences the work that you do. So that would be my question very basically for you. And Genghis, my question for you is actually, um, uh, it's actually, and I don't mean this in any way with irony, I actually mean, what is it, it's interesting that your father or your parents or family owns a Durner sto restu uh, restaurant, and I'm curious, what have you learned about graphic design from the business of Durner um, and from even the like uh, on a structural level. And then I'll just add a random comment in there, which is just <laughs> but this whole... But maybe we can deal yeah, with the sorry. two questions. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. All sorry. right, yeah. it's all right. Sid, is, uh, is your name Sid by any chance? It's mine? It's yeah. Uh, okay, Prem. Oh. Yeah, I think I... Anyway, uh, yeah, so <laughs> big. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the question. So maybe, yeah, to give a, a little bit background about myself. Um, I studied in Paris uh, in um, art school, Olivier de Serre. Uh, I studied, um, like I had this one preparatory year of uh, exploring many things. And then I had a, a bachelor in um, point of purchase advertisement, <laughs> which is uh, basically graphic design in three dimensions for different uh, yeah, shops or brands. Um, and uh, after that, I traveled to Dublin. I had a one year uh, exchange at the Dublin Institute of Technology in graphic design. And this is where I already, I think their approach was much more, a little bit more experimental <laughs> than um, my actual sc school, because my school was quite strict, actually. Um, and then I moved to Berlin, and uh, I had an internship in a graphic design studio that I applied for. And I, I would say that in this uh, studio, I. This is where I really started to um, develop uh, my own uh, practice because I had a lot of freedom. And this also coincided with the moment when I moved to Berlin. Uh, so it was basically me discovering a new culture, a new architecture, a new everything. And uh, so I was really into this explorative exploration um, mood, <laughs> and um, yeah, I guess that's how it all started. Uh, your question for me was what I learned from my dad's dinner kebab shop, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like for, graphic for graphic designer. Well, I learned a lot, first of all, how <laughs> to make OG dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe this it's time for my trigger slide. <laughs> now the other one. The other okay, one. Okay, I see. Yeah. So this is actually the only picture I have left from uh, that period of my dad. This is like the it doesn't exist anymore, by the way. Uh, but this is the facade of my uh, dad's dinner kebab shop in Apeldoorn. 
uh, Cafetaria Zumra. <coughs> and yeah, what I learned was that, um, so, you know, I was still studying graphic design. I studied uh, it in Arnhem at Artes. And uh, so my dad asked, like, can you make the logo? I need some menu cards. I need something for the window. So I was like, sure. So I came with this, like, idea of uh, of a graphic identity and what it should be. Like, you know, this, like, um, um, what, what's the name? Uh, so, like, this consistent uh, um, uh, unit, like, entity, you know, of, li like, a d uh, like, a graphic uh, identity should have, like, a concept, some, you know, some rules, some, like, consistent style, and so on. Um, so I, I so I made him his logo. I made his uh, his things, and like every time I would also work in the shop. By the way, from time to time, and um, I remember like every time visiting the shop, something else has changed. So like he would get this new sponsorship with Coca Cola, and then he had like these template designed uh, stickers on his window, or he get like branded merchandise from uh, from the food brands mm. uh, or he will make like uh, self-made uh, flyers f in, in Microsoft Word, you know. Um, so I learned um, about what, because we're talking about like identity tonight. Um, so I really uh, learned about what uh, other things a, a graphic identity could be, like a graphic identity uh, of a, like a corporate identity, it could have maybe three logos instead of one, or it mm. could have like incorporate different styles. It could, it's really like this, uh, at my dad's shop, it really became this collage of, uh, that was a reflection of the everyday running a cafeteria, of, of, uh, of a, a reflection of like everyday uh, hustle, basically. Mm. Um, which is more, much more like a true and direct, um, um, yeah, reflection of uh, of the shop and ac its actual identity. So that's uh, some stuff I learned, and later on also while working at this uh, Rotterdam-based uh, advertising studio. Mm. I also have like, um, yeah, this uh, so. I'm thinking about liberating the means of representation. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, templates uh, and layperson software. Um, so usually we think of like a corporate identity when you design it, it's something unique, it's something mm. special, you need a special software, it's something that nobody else has. But what I think is also quite interesting um, is this idea of placing in the hands of the clients or creating systems uh, that can be placed in the hands of the clients through templates, through standard formats, uh, through popular software mm. um, that they can later kind of manage on their own. So, yeah, I was wondering, just throwing that out. I mean, I know you have research uh, ongoing uh, on this topic uh, called the radical inkjet mm -hmm. and A4, the, the A4 template as a liberatory framework for mm -hmm. design. So mm -hmm. maybe segue into, yeah, what's the role of, yeah, the the templates mm. in the creation of a unique identity. Should I go first? Yeah, go first. <laughs> <laughs> but you, uh, you're nodding too. You're like, mm -hmm, no, I'm yeah, going no. next. I have something to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You want to go first? No, no, go first. Uh, what's the role of templates? I, I think uh, a lot of people can make uh, like a lot of amazing stuff themselves these days, like mm. even with uh, in-app uh, tools. I don't know, in Instagram, you can basically make a, a flyer f or, uh, yeah, I say yes to that. <laughs> I don't know, I like it. Like You, uh, you want to talk more about some of this stuff? Radical like inkjet. Yeah, radical mm. inkjet yeah. and A4 is like this, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that is basically like this. Uh, so in my iPhone, I like take a lot of photos on daily basis of stuff I see on the street. And one of the folders I called radical inkjet. And it's just this collection of um, inkjet printed A4 flyers, often like designed in Word, Microsoft Word. Uh, that is, yeah, also an exploration of like how, um, f yeah, this template culture. So how the 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 the, the ground like the outcome uh, of a, of a, of, of if you make something, how that is like um, 
induced by software. Uh, so uh, if you make something in Microsoft Word, it looks differently mm -hmm. than when you make something in uh, Ad Adobe mm -hmm. program or other programs. And uh, yeah, how this form fo follows really this, uh, this software. And I, I really, um, it, yeah, it really shows like all the, um, the different things you can do apparently with uh, Microsoft Word and yes. all, all the hidden uh, effects and uh, oh, but also like, um, yeah. So so I am really, um, but also yeah, how software that is not meant to uh, be used for design are used mm -hmm. actually f to make design. Mm -hmm. I mean, Word is uh, a text editing software. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you, you, do you want to add? Um, yeah, actually, your question um, just made me think of um, one recent project that I've been working on, and I thought it could be interesting to share it, but I don't have m really uh, pictures yet, but also in that f uh, sense, because it is a, a sort of a modular brand identity. So um, it happened because, um, I was in touch with this client who needed branding for their series of podcasts. And uh, throughout the whole communication, I could understand that uh, they had a craving actually for also being creative within this project. Um, they are um, a handballer, a professional handballer, and they are taking one year break to focus on uh, other questions uh, uh, about more philosophical question about themselves. And um, so when I was working on this brand identity, I was really trying to find a way that uh, as a client, yeah, they would be able as well to play with it, uh, also to, feel, to fulfill that side that they're also, um, yeah, want to explore. And so um, it was quite interesting in the process because uh, I, I created a sort of a template uh, with uh, a, a more of a process, a process to create a template. And uh, within this process, um, they will be able to just uh, create so many different templates and play with the text, still play with some of the graphics that I created, but um, on their own. And, uh, and then um, we even had a little uh, design workshop that I was uh, showing them how to use Illustrator, and I prepared a little notice of how they can play with it. And now I can see on Instagram like that they are just you know playing with things, having fun, and I think it's quite nice because it's uh, a word that I've created, but then it kind of uh, has also a way to evolve within um, the space of my client and uh, for them to also improvise with it. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, you. I think the way that design is taught is about, or, or design around identities is taught, is like to homogenize, to standardize, to control. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it's interesting to have this philosophy of really a loss of control yeah, exactly. and, and, and allowing the client to own their designs exactly. by participating. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, to identify with their own identity, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite, yeah, interesting uh, maybe we can do like a maybe it's time for another trigger slide yeah. we can maybe see <laughs> sophie's trigger slide is that yours no unfortunately Next I, one. I, I didn't bring I oh you forgot, didn't i forgot oh your presentation was your trigger oh uh, yeah okay <laughs> or maybe maybe this trigger slide uh, wait last one see. last one before yeah, it's, uh, it's a video i'm oh that one yeah this one. Ooh, can we play the oh it's a video okay sorry <laughs> sorry Okay, it's a. So is it yeah. Oh yeah, could you play it? Thank you. Sorry, didn't understand. It was a video. We are. Uh, my microphone is not on. We are looking. There. Hello. Yeah. We are looking at um, some photos of the Schiedamse Weg in Rotterdam. And um, yeah, this is like a process from the last five years, I think. Uh, 
what happened here was um, this was some sort of um, gevel aanpak slash schoonmaak actie aanpak uh, which was if I understand correctly pushed by the gemeente to the lokale ondernemersvereniging so local organization of business owners in this street and the street is really known for its uh, like it has a high uh, migrant population and a lot of like small businesses like catering to this uh, to all these local um, communities um, and it was really I mean I love this street uh, it has amazing shops amazing food uh, amazing shop signs um, but th somewhere like some years ago they decided to remove all the um, remove all the original shop signs and replace it for like uh, one standardized um, um, identity for the whole street which includes like a gray uh, facade um, thingy with like white uh, typography on top of it and they now every shop have the has the same um, logo ba signage basically and it was to attract um, like attract customers make it more attractive uh aspirational also yeah may like make it uh, also more clean because it apparently was like too loud or too aggressive too messy or to just name some terms that i i've read in the because this whole process was documented very well in like local uh newspaper like local um communications um so i think yeah if we talk about identity uh, that is also being translated into like visual everyday uh, culture and design. Um, I just think it's an interesting uh, case study, like uh, what what happens here and what also can be like the dangerous part of like um, of this i this like popular idea of identity. What is is like and also the hyper focus of like dutch policy making on what uh of like having like everything should be like one yeah one consistent one. identity right yeah the street is now color colorblind mm. the street is now colorblind yeah. union says it's post racial <laughs> yeah. it's black yeah. and white yeah, yeah. What is this trigger for? What is this trigger slide trigger for uh, other people in the room? Sophie? Uh, it's all caps as well. <laughs> it's all caps as well. We have from the audience. But, all, mostly white lettering. Mm, but all mostly white letterings. It's ugly. That's not me, that's somebody in the audience, that's Karen. <laughs> and by the way, this not only happens in Schiedamseweg, you see this as at almost, yeah. Uh, a lot of neighborhoods uh, happening, uh, yeah. similar processes of uh, mm. gentrification. I mean, I, I don't have a lot to say about it, but um, the first thing that uh, comes to my mind is uh, Paris, because uh, in Paris, uh, everything is very homogeneous. There are so many rules into what you can or can't do into... Uh, uh, facade of a building um, and um, yeah it it looks very clean it looks uh, very homogeneous it looks uh, very yeah very clean and um, I compare it to Berlin <laughs> when there is no rules at all <laughs> And um, the city has uh, quite of a different uh, feeling when you walk into. Uh, so I would say um, more freedom. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, yeah. here we go. Uh, can we have a microphone? You can use mine, actually, here. Bonjour, je m'appelle Moussa. Bonjour Moussa. Ce que tu as dit c'est magnifique. Ce que tu as dit c'est magnifique. Mm. Mais je crois que je suis plus fort que vous. Oh oui, certainement. Parce que chez nous Afrique, tu as ton paquet, tu fais ce que tu veux. Tu prends une flèche, 
tu fais flèche. Mon papa, il est commerçant. Mon papa, il est commerçant. Donc, il a une flèche. Il a mis ça devant le comptoir avec un, une hache. Je peux traduire ouais. Et il va s'en va. Parce qu'il adore ça. Uh, so uh, what you said and what you said was super interesting or uh, magnifique, uh, wonderful. Uh, but uh, Musa, f uh, hi, I'm Musa. Um, Musa thinks uh, he's uh, stronger than you or going further. Mm -hmm. uh, in Africa, uh, people uh, do what they want. Uh, so his father uh, had a shop. Uh, when you want to draw an arrow, you do it mm -hmm. uh, you and by hand. Mm -hmm. et, et, euh, et ensuite, tu voulais dire autre chose Oui. Euh, pour, euh, ça veut dire pourquoi je dis que l'Afrique noire, c'est plus fort. Mm -hmm. Tu fais, toi, graphiste, comment tu veux Il y a qui travaille, qui vend un logo. Mm -hmm. Mais toi aussi, tu n'es pas obligé d'acheter. Mm -hmm. Tu fais ce que tu veux. Tu mm -hmm. prends un marteau, tu fais mm -hmm. devant la porte. Tu prends un grand boxeur, tu mets devant la fenêtre là-bas. Tu prends voilà, un, un, une carafe craft d'eau, le truc là où met l'eau, oui, les calabasses, tu mets devant ton, 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 ton shop. Mm. Euh, um, so, il y a peut-être aussi beaucoup de handmade uh, by the people who mm. just uh, own the shop. Mm. Uh, so, many examples, uh, like a calabasse or a thing where in which you put water and stuff. Uh, in shop, tu vois une calabasse, c'est no man, mm -hmm. les peuls. Moi, je suis peul. From the um, peul uh, people, for instance, nomadic people. Mm -hmm. uh, les Wolofs, euh, les euh, cultures Sénégal, les Wolofs, eux, c'est pirog. Mm -hmm. For Wolof, it's more like a, a small boat, pirog. Dans les paquets, dans les shops, mm -hmm. euh, les, 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 les Wolofs Sénégal, c'est pirogue. Ah, so they draw a pirogue, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, a small, this small uh, boat, uh, as also a sign of uh, where, uh, which culture you belong to. Mm. Oui. Et il y a aussi des commerçants, eux, c'est le marabout. Le marabout gris-gris. Mm. Ils ont le photo marabout. Il euh, y a aussi d'autres commerçants qui ont chapelet. Tu restes, mm. tu vends, tu as ton chapelet dans ta main. Mm. Donc, euh, Chacun, il a sa design. Mm. Mais ici, c'est dommage, il y a l'argent, c'est beau, mais vous n'êtes pas indépendant. Mm. Vous tous, mm. vous n'êtes pas indépendant parce qu'il n'y a personne qui n'ose pas faire ce qu'il veut. Mm. Mais moi, chez moi, mm. Afrique, Sénégal, mm. je fais ce que je veux, <rire> mais des belles choses. Mais ici, vous n'êtes pas indépendant. Tu as des limites, tu ne dois pas faire ça. Tu as des limites, tu ne dois pas faire ça. Tu as des limites, tu ne dois pas faire ça. Tu as des limites, tu ne dois pas faire ça. Mais Afrique, on fait ce qu'on veut. Mm. So, he <laughs> so here, uh, there are more rules and uh, less independence uh, for, for doing things, it seems. Um, and uh, there is more free. Il n'y a pas d'assurance, il n'y a pas de mutuelle. Travail, work. Pas de mutuelle, pas d'assurance. Travaille, après tu fais ce que tu veux. Tu travailles, tu manges, tu ne travailles pas, c'est ton problème. Donc, pas de. Tu gardes ici, tu ne gardes pas ici. Il n'y a pas de mutuelle, il n'y a pas d'assurance, il n'y a pas de remboursement. Tu fais ce que tu veux. S'il y a remboursement, il y a mutuelle. Il y a qui On te dit, mets là, tu mets là, tu mets là. Il n'y a pas de remboursement, il n'y a pas de mutuelle, il n'y a pas d'assurance, il n'y a pas de hôpital. Après, on te dit, fais ça. Non, non. Mm. Non. Donc, état, il n'y a pas de mutuelle. Il n'y a pas d'assurance, il n'y a pas gratuit, il n'y a pas logement, euh, maison de logement, il logement, n'y a pas, il n'y a pas. Donc, tu laisses les gens. Ah, ok, oui. Yeah. The state is ah. less, mm -hmm. yeah, provides also less, uh, like, uh, insurances and, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I, I forgot you said it three times, um, and, and this kind of uh, things, but then the counterpart is uh, then uh, that, yeah, they just also leave you uh, do stuff. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Thank for you. the input. Thank you. Yeah, I guess it, it, what you said, um, I, if I would rephrase it, uh, uh, as um, there is more freedom uh, in that sense of uh, people are maybe um, 
Um, like they, they build things more themselves um, and, uh, and within what they, they build there, was, there is uh, much less rules um, in general. We have another a question. Is there anybody else who hasn't asked a question who would like to ask? You yeah, can ask um, <laughs> if not, we can, anybody else? Um, all right. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just wanted to make two short comments. Um, I, when, um, in all of this, there's a phrase that's been resonating in my head um, from the biodiversity activist Vandana Shiva, and she often talks about the production of uniformity. Mm. So what was interesting, Sophie, is you talked about bringing the diversity, and of course, this trigger image or video of this street, it shows that actually in many naturally occurring systems, diversity and difference is already the baseline, mm. but it's the production of uniformity that Im superimposes these systems. And then in the two examples that both of you, Genghis and Sophie provided, Sophie with the templates that you created for your client or commissioner so that they could make them some things themselves and have fun with it, mm. and Genghis with the Durner shop and how the identity was overlaid with these multiple layers, what resonates for me is that in the 1990s, there was so much of a discourse around variable identity systems and mm. identity systems that could change, but so often they were still top down. Mm. They were still about the rules that the designer put in place that they mm. believed that other people would enjoy, mm. as opposed to the things like that were described that either brought people joy that they want to create, mm -hmm. or the things that come out of an either economic or business necessity to overlay those things mm. rather than it coming from the designer. So mm. I really appreciate those examples. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, do we still have time for more questions? Yes? If, if you have other questions, I can just... Uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's your time to shine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, um, it's a question to you too, but uh, going from something you said, Sophie, mm -hmm. uh, the thing that you said, uh, thinking with your heart and thinking with your uh, head, mm -hmm. um, and I imagine that you too, uh, knowing that you work with people who uh, um, have the same, uh, who share the same culture, the same language, the same maybe also values mm -hmm. sometimes, um, sometimes. <laughs> How do you work? Do you work with your heart? And how do you arrive to take this, uh, find this balance uh, between giving the, the heart, your passionate work inside the work that you're doing because it's related to your research, let's say, and your um, values, personal values, and also how do you interact with the reality of today when mm -hmm. where it's, there's money inside and there's um, no compromise sometimes. Mm. Is it the heart or the head? It, it, to who do you address uh, it? You too. You, okay. um, yeah, it's quite of a um, tough question, but I think it's a bit of a mixture of both um, that um, is organically moving, <laughs> uh, not like uh, one is predominant or the other is predominant, but it's rather a flow of uh, the two of them, uh, trying to think. <laughs> um, but of course, I work a lot with my heart because it's, uh, f like I said from the beginning, like uh, in my work, I put so much of myself, so, um, I, I will obviously, whenever I work with a client, um, like actually, whenever I work with a client, the thing that I love the most is the conversation that I will have with them and um, them presenting me their project and me wanting to support them. Uh, so this is the heart, I guess. But the head uh, has to be there for more critical reasons because um, 
Uh, yeah, it's hard, but I, I, I really try to reflect on everything whenever my client uh, has an idea or wants something. It's not like I'm not going to necessarily do it. Um, I, um, I always say that, like, yeah, it's a bit of this conver conversion point between my what my clients want and what I can offer as well. It's um, so, and I also try to educate my clients uh, when they propose silly ideas <laughs> that I think it's against my values. I am not going to move further, and I'm going to try to explain them why we could not do this. So. Yeah, it's a bit of an energy in between the the two, for me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really well said by oh. Sophie. Uh, <laughs> I can relate to that as well as it being a mixture. Sometimes something is uh, it's just there. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case. Um, I also like to do uh, a lot of research and um, yeah, and work with certain um, rash, no, ra ratio, ratio and ru certain rules, but then again also uh, really play with that or like follow a certain uh, intuition. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, it really depends on the project as well. Uh, sometimes uh, it's also just there, you know. From mm. it yeah. just <laughs> yeah. it can also yeah it can also be very that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think instead of like trying to perpetuate this divide between the mind and the body or the mind and the heart, um, maybe it's useful to think of like the flesh. Um, which is what happens mm -hmm. when the mind and the body are connected through the realm of experience. Um, so perhaps to think of, yeah, I guess, yeah, to think of a reaction that is fleshy, um, mm -hmm. that has skin in the game, and that, yeah, responds uh, not just to what you're feeling or what you're thinking, but also to uh, what the room is giving you. Um, and I would say, yeah, some clients, like, uh, yeah, <laughs> sometimes I think it's also useful to make a distinction between clients and constituencies and maybe certain clients need to be educated but perhaps constituencies do not um, and what happens when the designer gives themselves over to a community to a constituency and doesn't tell them how they should represent themselves but rather puts themselves at the service of how they want to be represented mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's this like uh, responding to each situation. A, a client is different from a community or a constituency. Um, I did have one, I think we're, our, our time is almost over. We have one minute um, according to my watch and I wanted to ask the two of you one last question. Do you have like final lapidary words like or like a, you know, memeable last advice uh, as to how to approach um, design of identities with love, since it is about affective graphic design. <laughs> uh, I can start if you want. Yeah. So um, I think, I mean, I've already mentioned a little bit, but the notion of uh, building a community around uh, you in your circle. I think it's something quite important for me. Um, so not necessarily um, trying to, um, I need to think another second. Okay. <laughs> Chinggis, go. Think <Yeah>. memeable. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, please repeat it one more time. Uh, final last words, yeah. memeable advice on how to approach the design of identities with love. Yeah. <laughs> uh, You're a meme lord. You can do this. <laughs> um, well, I'm sorry, I also have to think about it. Just... Uh, 
I, 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 I guess I, I love to collaborate with my friends, for example. Anytime I can, I just try to bring them into the, my projects um, and, uh, and vice versa. So I think approaching with love is approaching with your communities, like building this together. Um, I, I see uh, in Berlin, within my friends, uh, so many different projects developing uh, that are um, into supporting the hood, supporting the minorities, supporting uh, a, a few things. And uh, I just love to see um, all this project that maybe people started to build years ago. And now, you know, coming into uh, a conversion point where we all interact into the scene. So I, I would say uh, collaborating with more love, maybe uh, try to collaborate uh, more with the people you trust. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I had to think about that. We are uh, talking a lot about like client-based work mm. uh, this evening, but I know you are also, you make your own work. I do as well. I also collaborate a lot with friends or I just I just make stuff with friends. I, mm. I do stuff in my own time. Uh, I take a lot of photos and like none of like not always they have like already a specific purpose in mind or like uh, it is uh, it's just stuff that that you do or um, because I don't know you like it or you, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And I also I, I got to uh, understand that this is for me at least really uh, important to to do like um, and to also see the uh, progression in that or how that at some points uh, also comes back to you or to your practice um, so if maybe that's an advice like um, uh, yeah just uh, doing stuff <laughs> <that you> <laughs> <laughs> just do stuff uh, no yeah yeah, that it's also not everything has to be uh, f for a client or not everything has to be a project. It can also mm -hmm. be something that uh, makes you happy or mm -hmm. that you don't know yet what it is going to be or mm -hmm. what the purpose is of it. But then maybe uh, in some time uh, and you don't need the art education for that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Cengiz and Sophie and everybody. <laughs>
again, a very formal, very philosophical interpretation as the art historian she is. And to end right now with a trigger image of the uh, neutrality that is uh, purported through a sans serif uh, in a background, and of course, as Karen well noted, in alphabetical, all caps, which was already uh, addressed here, is uh, quite gives you a sense that graphic design has a, a lot of work to do, as we all do, in, uh, in the visual arts and at institutions, but also in the work that, uh, that we have of people working with images mm -hmm. and signs and uh, the importance of resignification of signs. And because graphic design is really the mediator between a, a public and an institution, for us, a graphic design has been a central aspect of rethinking the systems by which we can change a, and become more aware and more engaging a, with a public commitment mm -hmm. to represent our present. Mm -hmm. So graphic design is not just a matter of whether it looks nice or not, a, for us, how it's made, and that's why I really enjoyed the, the presentation a, with the work plats, graphic designers and the student collective a, designing documenta a, graphic image a, from Jakarta. So the conversations of a, how we come to make it, whether it's the passion, passion research that Nina Paim spoke about this morning, a, whether it's the love out of love and the interdependencies that Prem spoke about and we again speak about love now, mm -hmm. a, whether it's trust, mm -hmm and a gentleman's agreement, as you say, <laughs> a, or the professional client relationship a, that we generally tend to have at one point or the other, whether because it's a patron a, or a policy a competition that we're a, going through, or and of course, individuals. I think that really a, what we're up to task is to be true to ourselves, as Sophie has said here, and really think. so how uh, we can influence in our own way, uh, just bringing a, a, a broader awareness mm -hmm. of the cultural diversity that we must uh, confront and learn from and uh, readily coexist with. Just to end, because it's late and we've been here for two days, <laughs> you know, uh, thinking with graphic designers and artists and makers in general about uh, that mediation, I really want to uh, thank in absentia, uh, Thomas Castro, who helped shape uh, this conference through a uh, very casual conversations mm -hmm. that were instrumental to identify participants, and Yin Yin, mm -hmm. who uh, <laughs> who brought yeah, it's amazing. Uh, Yin Yin, who uh, brought many uh, active uh, makers today. Uh, I tend to always uh, have the dilemma that uh, even if I like it, I'm always in more the academic. Uh, I'm like, no, the keynotes, let's focus on historically. But it is about partnering with people that are uh, not just thinking uh, reflexively, but actually in the making, like Yin Yin, is, uh, that can connect us uh, very meaningfully to, uh, to you all here. So thank you to Yin Yin. I also want to give a shout out to Pilar, who amazingly uh, participated. <laughs> in the planning, yay! Uh, Pilar is an artist and um, she has been uh, balancing her exhibition opening remotely that happened uh, yesterday in Australia with a conference, so working day and night to accommodate uh, uh, all of the participants and also the public in this day. So thank you so much, Pilar, for everything. And I have to say that uh, Jeroen uh, Laven has been working at the institution for some years. Uh, we don't call him youngster because that word is ousted in this institution. We can no longer call anyone youngster, an emerging professional. <laughs> that, uh, yay! <laughs> that uh, worked very, uh, Jesse, Jesse already left, but he came to also give you cheers that really took on our work learn program. Uh, that's already in its third edition and will launch the fourth edition as soon as uh, Jesse comes back from the Caribbean. <laughs> but uh, Jeroen really uh, led the collective learning program here in practice for the last year so that we could have not only a logo for the effective gra graphic design uh, conference, but also the new identity for Kunst Institut Meli, of which we're very happy to have the designers here in house. Yay! <laughs> yeah. 
So finally to Gabby, Lynn, and mm. Michelle. I don't know. My Ryan, I don't ever know how to pronounce your name. For all the technical, they have uh, <laughs> very, very uh, actively been uh, transmitting uh, everything online. It's to the public that's connecting from different parts of the world and which we're very happy to host. Thank you, Bruno, curator at the Jan van Eyck Academy, for partnering with us to also be able to promote this to your communities and, uh, and to transmit it on the YouTube channel of the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. There should be some drinks, but I think that we're really gonna close, no, and like just go eat or something, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. They're saying, Sofia, no more. <laughs> I didn't send any more WhatsApp say of like, let's have more wine, but uh, I'm really hoping that you can come and see our exhibitions. Uh, they're here for some time. They are presenting great artists uh, from here and abroad. And uh, we have a program tomorrow again. We have the performance, yes. <laughs> Yeah, we have the performance of Joy Maria Ma Smith uh, that's going to be happening uh, all day tomorrow from 11 to 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. For those that feel uh, close to Joy Maria Ma Smith's work, which is upstairs, we'll be having drinks uh, f at Meli from 4 to 6 p.m. downstairs. And there's a training. There's also the, the tea, the herbal training in 84 Steps. So if you want to come and hang out with us tomorrow, we'll be here. <laughs> so thank you so much all for coming.